Hi, Remington from Southern Shoddy 3D, and we here at MoGraph Mentor are very grateful this year for all of our students. And as a way of saying thank you, we would like to provide this free texture pack. It has about 30 materials in it and a couple patterns so that you can kind of mix and match and create even more variations from that. They're PBR materials, which means they're compatible with most render engines. And we're going to walk you through how to set up your material in this video. This lesson's actually listed from our texturing course, and all of our courses are 40% off right now. If you'd like to go check that out, look at the link in the description below. For now, let's get started and learn how to set up these PBR materials. Let's walk through how we can use our textures here in Redshift Render Engine in Cinema 40. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to go to Redshift here, Materials. I'm going to create a new material there. And I already have a kettle in my scene, so I'm just going to call this kettle one and drag that over kind of the one I already have in there so that we can start from scratch. I'm going to double click that and open that. We'll be using the kind of node view here. And then I'm going to drag these maps in here. Now, Redshift uses OpenGL, so we're going to go ahead and grab all of our maps in there. And I didn't have my file path set, so it's going to kind of prompt me and I don't want to copy these over. And that should give us all of our nodes that we can work with in here. So let's go ahead and spread these out here. Now that doesn't matter what order these go in vertically. I'm just kind of doing this just based on organization on how I plan to show them to you. So let's go ahead, grab our roughness, move that up there, normal down here, mixed AO. Now I hardly ever used the ambient inclusion map. I find it better just to use ambient inclusion from the render engine that I'm using. But how you would mix those is you would go about grabbing a color composite node, and then you could take this texture we'll call that the base color and the blend color. We'll take the out color, we'll drag it over here and we'll do a diffuse color there. And then we can change the um, composite mode up here to multiply. And you'll see that that will apply the ambient inclusion. Now I don't want that ambient inclusion usually. So I normally don't do that process. And you can just drag the base color directly in there and select the diffuse color as I did coming from this composite node. Now, one thing to note is that on all these maps, we need to pay attention to kind of uh, the gamma of those. Now, color space is a really complicated topic that we could deep dive into. So I'm just gonna give you the high level overview here is that if you are exporting textures from Substance Painter, if it has color information, for example, your ambient inclusion and your base color, you're gonna wanna throw that into sRGB if you're using the same settings I did. And then things like your roughness and metallic that aren't actually like contributing to the color per se, you will not use sRGB. And you can set these in your render settings, but we're gonna go ahead and override to make sure that we're controlling that here and have correct. So we can take our ambient inclusion, hit enable, call that sRGB, base color, enable sRGB. And then these we're just going to enable and leave the gamma there. And I believe, I may be incorrect, normally when you adjust these in other render engines, you adjust the gamma to 2.2. And I believe when you're hitting sRGB, it's kind of doing that for you. I may be doing uh, that incorrectly, but I believe that's what it's kind of doing when you check that. So here we have the roughness. We're gonna go ahead and we're going to grab this roughness. We're going to put that up over here and let go and then we can see that we have our base properties reflection going to come over here to reflection roughness we have our metallic texture here and we can go ahead grab this put this up here let go base reflection reflection metalness and then we can come down here to our normal map and we'll have to add an extra node for that. So let's kind of look at the settings we have here. So when we click our redshift material, we can have these base properties and you can set a custom one and kind of start there if you want, like with one of these, but I'm just gonna go ahead and leave mine at custom there. Now, because I have this metallic texture plugged into here and we have a mixture of metal and uh, plastic, you can normally just leave this to the default settings. But because we have metal, we're gonna do a little extra step here. We're gonna take this BRDF, we're going to change this to GGX, and then this Fresnel type down here, we're gonna change it from IOR to metalness. And then that should feed into that reflectivity. And we can see here that it updates there that our metal parts look metal and this black over here, which is our rubber, looks a little better there. 
Now you can play with some of these other settings if you want. So for reflectivity, you'll see here that it's black. And if we twirl this down, we see that our value is 4%. Now you can play with this setting and what this is going to do is adjust the reflectivity of your overall object. But what I've found is that if you're using dielectric materials, things like wood and fabric, you don't really have to worry about this. And if you're doing an all metal object, you really don't have to worry about this. But the reason I chose the kettle is because it's a mixture of metal and plastic. And if I were to render it now and you can see up here that the plastic has almost no shine left. Whereas if we grab this and turn that up, you can see that that's becoming reflective. Now, there's not necessarily a physically accurate number here. This really just comes up to kind of playing with our reflectivity and how reflective you want that plastic to be or those elements that aren't metal. I find that bumping it up around a 10% usually does pretty well, but by default, when you drag it in there, it puts it at 4%. I find that anything that's not metal loses almost all its reflectivity. So you can play with that value here until you get something that you feel looks correct artistically. Now we need to do a displacement node and we actually need to do an extra node for that. So what we're gonna do is search bump node here. Now there is a normal map node and you don't wanna use that. That's being phased out. You want this bump map node. So we're gonna grab that bump map we're going to drag that into here. We're going to take our normal map and we're going to put that into the bump map. And we'll get these options. We're going to do texture input. And then we're going to grab our output here. We're going to hover over there. And we have all these options. And it can be kind of difficult to wonder where normal map is. But it's hiding here under overall in bump input. Then we can grab this bump map. And you can see that we have different types of inputs. So if we were using a bump map or something else, you might want to use height field. But because we're using a normal map, we're going to do tangent space normal. And then if you had, we used an OpenGL map, so we don't have to do this. But if you put in an OpenGL or a DirectX map and you notice that your normals, so like kind of like the surface imperfections and things are kind of like indented the incorrect direction, you can click this little flip normal Y here and that will invert that normal map and correct it for you. Since we drag an OpenGL in there, we shouldn't have an issue. Just something I wanted to point out that if you're downloading materials or if you maybe export it incorrectly. So next let's take a look at our displacement. So we have our displacement node here and we wanna have, a, again, another extra node there. If you search displacement up here, you can grab this displacement node, drag this into here. It'll give us our texture, text map. We can take this output and instead of putting it on here, we're going to put it over here and we're going to select displacement. Now, displacement won't work by default, you need to add a redshift object tag. I'll show you how to do that in a second, but I wanna talk about displacement for a second. Now, I don't ever hardly use displacement. You'll notice that it's not turned on in any of our scenes because displacement is very heavy and drastically slows down your render times. Now, where it's useful is if you're doing something like turning a plane into a brick and you have a pretty drastic change in geometry, but for the most part, I leave mine off due to the fact that it's just a little too render intensive. So it's X out of there. And if we wanted to use that displacement tag, we would need to look at our redshift object tag. And then we could go over to the um, geometry here. And by default, this is off, but you can click override and then you can enable tessellation and enable your displacement. And then you can then begin kind of changing those values. Now you see here that with my displacement scale that I have a very low value. By default, this is like one or 10, but I find that 0 0.0 increments are usually where I'm at. Depends on your displacement math and the strength of it, but you wanna keep these numbers really low to start. Under here, you can kind of adjust all of your settings, maximum displacement, so it won't go above one. And then you can, of course, kind of play with some of these, the type of subdivision. And what that's doing is it's adding extra subdivisions to your geometry so that it can displace it more accurately. Because if you have a really low poly object and you try and displace it, it's only gonna have a couple faces to work with. So what this is doing, like with maximum subdivisions, is adding more subdivisions to help add more geometry so that you have more to displace. You can adjust those settings. The higher you subdivide it, the more accurate it's going to be, but the slower it's going to render and it renders quite slow. This generally doesn't work well on animated objects and you have to have pretty good topology to kind of work with displacement. So that's something you're gonna to wanna to keep in mind. Now let's open back up our material here 
And I will point out that in the displacement, you can also change the scale and information here, though I find that this generally doesn't affect my object. I really need to play with those settings down here if I want to control my displacement. And with that, you should be set up to render your object in Redshift.